Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, I would like to welcome everybody to today's seminar uh, on the occasion of the HKTDC Hong Kong Book Fair 2017. Today we are very honored to have Mr. Mark O'Neill to share with us the book uh, Sir Robert Hart, The Irish Man Who Ran the Imperial Marine Time Customs of the Qing Dynasty from 1863 to 1911. Uh, this seminar will be conducted in English. So please switch off your mobile phone or turn it to vibration mode. All kinds of recordings such as audio, video, and still photography are not allowed during the seminar. Without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up to Mr. Mark O'Neill and Mr. Shib Tao. Thank you. Thank you for your very uh, laconic and very efficient introduction. I meet Mark only once a year, which is amazing. After this lecture, he'll disappear. And uh, our next encounter will be next July. In the meantime, we don't hear uh, from each other. And I know he is, uh, he is going to be buried again in a new project of writing on another fascinating uh, historical uh, subject or a historical personality. So when I first, w w when I met Mark this year, only a few weeks ago, right, I was kept very, very curious and itching to know who the, ne the hero would be uh, for his next book to be presented this year. And uh, I was um, very delighted uh, to know that uh, I'm very happy to know that he had picked up uh, Hart, an Irishman, to, uh, a, as a personality to write on, because this character, this figure, I have also touched upon from time to time in my column, but without so, many, uh, so much academic detail as Mark has uh, gleaned and gathered over years, very hard and diligent uh, writing time. So, I mean, it helps me to go through a journey with such details, uh, taking to back to the, uh, this journey, taking me back to the tunnel of time, to the old Shanghai in the 19th century. And um, with, uh, with so many sentimental and emotional echoes, because it is not just a, 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 a Guai Lo, or a white-skinned man, amazingly recruited by Empress Dowagers and his eunuchs. And he was allowed, miraculously, to claim his personal sovereignty over a very important institution of money in Shanghai. And he was allowed free hand to uh, rule his kingdom and build his ICAC at that time. So I'm sure Lord MacLehos, Murray MacLehos, or the Scotsman, must have heard of him before or after he came to Hong Kong, right? And now that Lord is long gone, right? <coughs> so it can never be verified. And reading hard today is a relevance because we all know what's happening in China. This uh, famous or notorious uh, billionaire on exile, Guo Wengui, is uh, telling uh, a, 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 a daily tale more exciting than 1,000 and one night or, or, or on the internet and on YouTube in relation to uh, a nationwide scale, uh, a national scale of uh, scandal of corruption. And that makes me, I'm not sure what you feel about, that makes me miss this historical figure called Hart, right, more than ever. So I'll cut my prologue short and hand it to Mark. What made you, what made you uh, write this book with so much insight and, uh, and with a sense of prediction, perhaps, if not relevance or immediacy? Well, I, <coughs> I would say that uh, he is quite similar to my grandfather. You know, we, we did uh, <coughs> a session about him three or four years ago. They are both from the north of Ireland. They're both from very religious families. They live 
all their adult life in China. They are very disciplined. They learn Chinese very well. But Hart was better than my grandfather because uh, he had a very high position in the government. He is a national figure in Chinese history. And he had two wives. He had a Chinese wife and an Irish wife, and he had six children. Now, my grandfather could only manage um, one wife <laughs> and three children, and even her, he couldn't manage her very well either. So Hart wins on all, all the counts. So having learned about grandfather, I, I found Sir Robert's life even more extraordinary and uh, worth telling. So that's why I wanted to write it. Anyway. I was amazed by all the details right, contained in this book. You've uh, certainly done a very thorough and diligent work of uh, statistics, but I'll leave it until later. Right? So this is just a summary of Sir Robert's life. As you can see, he was the, the head of the customs department for 48 years. He also founded the Chinese post office. But that is not all he did. He was also a diplomat for the Qing government. He made peace in the war between China and France. Uh, he was advising the Chinese government on all kinds of matters, including helping them purchase arms overseas. And then after the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, he became the chief advocate of China against the foreign powers. So uh, he did a, a very many things in his life. So this is the earliest photo we have of him. He's in his 30s. He's in China already. already okay? And he came from the north of Ireland. He was from a Protestant family, quite prosperous. So this was the family home, which is still standing uh, near Lisburn in Northern Ireland. His family was very devout Methodists. So they used to go to this church every Sunday. And he was so religious at this time, when he was 16, 17 years old, that uh, he was even thinking of becoming a missionary in China, like my grandfather. And he was listening to a sermon by a preacher who had spent time in China and was telling him, telling the congregation about China. And then Sir Robert looked to the, the door of the church and there were two very nice looking ladies there. So he suddenly forgot what it was the preacher was speaking about and he forgot about China. And he wrote in his diary that evening that perhaps it would be better for him not to become a missionary in China. Perhaps he should do something else in China. So he had that kind of self-knowledge. Now, anybody in the audience tell me where this is? Very good. We gave a talk last Friday at a Chinese uh, bookshop, and two of the audience had been to study there. So I think there's quite a strong connection between Hong Kong and Queen's University. This is where Sir Robert studied. So. He was born in Portadown, an upper middle class family. His father was very devout Methodist, so he sent him to Methodist schools in Taunton in England and then in Dublin. He went to Queen's University. He was the star student of his year. And at that time, Sir John Bowring, do you remember him? He was the governor of Hong Kong. Sir John Bowring said, we need to have a, a new kind of diplomat, a student interpreter. Because if a diplomat comes to China and starts working, they will not learn Chinese fast enough or deep enough. So we've got to give them two years to study. So he created this new category of person called student interpreter. And Queen's was invited to present someone for this position. And Sir Robert, because he was the best student, he was chosen. So he was just, uh, he was just 18 years old at that time. But after he got the appointment, then something rather unusual occurred. One of his uh, classmates said to him, your life is too boring, you're too studious, you're always learning stuff. There are lots of other things to do in life. So he took him to these um, houses of pleasure in Belfast, and he, how do we say this nicely? 
chip. He fell. He fell. Actually, he contracted a disease, so he couldn't go outside. Lam jo. Lam jo. Lam jo. So he should have spent the time saying goodbye to his uncle and his aunts and his grandparents and his teachers. <laughs> but he couldn't because he was in this very embarrassing situation. Maybe you can try to use this mic this is louder. Okay. So that's what he did in these last weeks in Belfast. He was just trapped in his room waiting for the chance to leave. So he, he, he leaves in 1854 and he comes to Hong Kong. That's the first stop in China. So that's what Hong Kong looked like when he arrived. So he comes to Hong Kong, he meets Sir John Bowring, has a few meetings, and then he's sent to Ningbo. This is his first posting, okay? So that's what Ningbo looked like at that time. It was a very important port city in eastern China. So in Ningbo, two things happen. The most important thing is to learn Mandarin. So that's what he did, and he was a very disciplined man, and he threw all his energies into learning Mandarin. And he didn't just have to learn the ordinary conversation, he had to learn the language of the officials, because these are the people he would be dealing with in the future. So he has to learn uh, classical Chinese, he has to read the, the, the Chinese classics. And then another thing that happens in Ningbo, he meets this very beautiful young lady, Miss Ayu, and she's the daughter of a Ningbo fisherman. And Miss Ayu is the love of his life. So they have three children and they stay together mm, almost for 10 years. Now, I'm a bit ashamed to tell you that the custom then for foreign men in these cities is to hire Chinese ladies. You could hire one for a month or three months or six months and then like a pair of, uh, like a shirt, you would then change it and have a new one. So this relationship that Sir Robert had with Miss Ayu is very unusual. And in his uh, writings, he is very uh, passionate about her. It's a very, um, a very unusual relationship. But in the end, it, marriage was not possible. Because at that time, as you know, marriage is, is not the choice of individual, it's the choice of the society. And especially if you wanted to become a high official like he did, you couldn't marry someone from a much lower uh, status of life. So what he did then was he then burned all the material related to Miss Ayu. So this posed a big problem for, for the biographer because, you know, a love affair is maybe the best part of the life of someone. You want to write about it, but you don't have any materials. But fortunately, a Chinese professor saved me because he read the same material that I read and he found the story so good that he wrote a novel about it. So because we have no documentary facts for this part of the story, I borrowed the material by this Chinese professor. So he gives you conversations between them. He describes the feelings for each other. Now, it's, it's, it's a novel. It's not based on history, but uh, I found it very convincing. So that's what I use in the book. So after his time in Ningbo, he's sent to, to Guangzhou. And at this time, Guangzhou is under the control of the British and the French armies. So this gentleman in the middle is the British consul, who's called Harry Parks. So H Parks is the boss of Hart at this moment. And what's happened is the, the British and the French armies have taken over this city, but they, they, they are finding it very difficult to manage it. And Guangzhou is an enormous city with a big population, very big commerce, you know, a very important place, and they don't have the ability to, to run it. So what Sir Robert does is he's the intermediary between the British and the French consuls, who are like the mayors of Guangzhou, and the Chinese officials who are still left behind. And they don't want to be there. They'd rather leave, but they can't. So for, for Sir Robert, it's a very good learning process. Every day he meets these very senior, very humiliated Chinese officials, and he has to deal with them and relate 
between them and then the, the British officials. The <coughs> city becomes increasingly chaotic. He has to have a bodyguard. And at this moment, this new customs service was set up in Shanghai by the foreigners because we're now at the time of the Taiping Rebellion. The Qing government is concentrating everything on trying to defeat the Taiping Rebellion and the customs service is not operating efficiently. So the foreigners insist that a new one be set up. So it is set up in Shanghai and Hart decides to join it. So he has to leave the British diplomatic service and join this new customs service. So this is the Shanghai Customs building at that time. So Hart is like the deputy of this. And as good luck would have it, his superior is a very arrogant British man who's called Horatio Lei, who is very contemptuous of Chinese. And uh, Horatio Lei decides he wants to have a holiday. So he, dis he just takes off, he takes the boat in Shanghai, goes for a holiday. He does not inform his bosses in Beijing, in the government, and he doesn't even ask them. So the, the, the officials in Beijing are very angry about this. So they summon Sir Robert, and he goes to Beijing, and they want him to take over. But they have to be convinced he's suitable. So these meetings he has in, in, in uh, June 1861 in Beijing, they are critical for his career. So it's his meetings with this gentleman, I'm sure you know him. He was the head of the Tsongli Yamen, which was the foreign ministry at the time. So Hart meets this man several times. In the beginning, Prince Gong is quite uneasy with him. He's, he's not used to dealing with foreigners, but he's very impressed with Hart's command of Chinese, his ability to explain how the customs service works. And this is the quote from Prince Gong, and we've put it on the back of the book. And I think you'll agree, to, it's just as true today. I think ministers in Beijing today, they have little idea what's going on, because they don't trust the information that's been given to them by their uh, staff. So I think Prince Gong was just, was just the same. So Sir Robert makes a very good impression on him and the others, and they say, OK, you set up this new custom service. So this is now what happens. So this very young man, he's still in his early 30s. He's given the job of setting up this completely new custom service from nothing. So this, uh, these are the main characteristics of this custom service. And it's really quite extraordinary that this young man sitting in Beijing came up with this model. First of all, he insists on having a wide range of nationalities. He doesn't want only British or only French. He chooses people from the countries that trade with China. And why do you think he wants people from different nationalities? What's the purpose? Well, if everyone is from the same country, then th they have their own private interest, their own faction, and they conspire together. So by having people from different countries, they are watching each other. They're preventing this faction from occurring. So you can see he has uh, staff from all different countries earliest form of European Union, perhaps. Yes, well, we call it League of Nations, except it's League of Nations has not been thought of, but he's come up with this idea. The second thing he does is um, he insists that everyone must speak uh, Mandarin and, and English, so all the foreigners who come, they have to spend at least two years in Beijing, and they have to do a written and spoken exam, and if they don't pass, they cannot work in the customs. And this, again, is very... Uh, unusual, especially at that time. Let's not speak about now, but at that time, to insist that all the foreigners must be fluent and able to at least to read uh, Chinese. And the third characteristic of his customs, as uh, Chip mentioned, is about the corruption. Everybody knew that the Chinese government then was extremely corrupt. 
uh, the government collected a large amount of money every year, but only a very small proportion of it left, uh, arrived in Beijing. So he had to come up with a system to prevent that happening in the customs. So what he did was he went to Europe, he looked at the best practice in different European countries, and he took from these countries the, the, the best practice and he used it in his customs service. So that gets us up to 1866. So the customs service is off, off and running, and now it's time to, to find a wife. So the first question is, what do we do with Madame Aryu and the three children? What do we do? What's your suggestion? If Sir Robert asks you, what, to, what, what should I do now? What would you say? Well, he has to separate with her. He can't uh, stay with her. It would not be allowed by the social norms of the time. So he gives her $3,000. And in exchange, she has to go away. And she has to give him the three children. So what he does is, he, when he goes back to Ireland, he takes them with them on the ship. And he arrives in London, and he finds this family, and he gives the three children to this family. And they become foster family, and he pays for all their expenses in the years afterwards. And why is it that he couldn't let them stay in China? Wouldn't that be easier? Why does he have to take them so far away? Yeah, uh, now you understand completely, yes. So for them, of course, it's a really terrible decision because they're being taken away from both their parents, put in a country they've never been to, in an environment they know nothing about. But yeah, he is too nervous. If they stay in China, they will reappear in his life and he, he has to keep it completely secret. So when they go to, to, to the UK, he pays money to this foster family, but nobody is to know who their parents are. And only one person knows, which is his secretary. He's the only one, and he's not allowed to tell anybody. So he, he deals with that, and then he goes back to his home place in the north of Ireland, and he finds a wife, and she's this 18-year-old lady, and she's the daughter of the family doctor, so it's quite straightforward. Now, before he marries her, he has to take one big decision. What, can you guess what that decision is? He's about to, to, to marry this lady. She's agreed to marry him. Are we honest with our wives? Do we tell them everything? No, no, but they're pro pro well, it, it would be the same. Actually, no, she's Protestant, but it would be the same, yeah. So in his diary, he says, I, I, of course, must be honest. I must tell my future wife everything. I mustn't keep secrets. But when the moment comes, like most men, he fails. <laughs> he tells a long story, very elaborate story, but he doesn't tell her the truth. He's too afraid of her reaction. So she doesn't know about the Chinese lady and the three, three children. Okay? So this is a very uh, official photo. Sir Robert and his wife and the first two children. Okay? So this is Sir Robert at work. As you can see, he didn't like to sit down. He, wrote, he worked standing up. And who's the man on the, on the left? What does he do? Sort of. I mean, Sir Robert could speak Chinese very well, but you have to write documents in Wen Yuan Wen, you know, in the, in the official Chinese, and he wasn't so good at that. So that's what this gentleman did. He would write the documents for Sir Robert in the appropriate uh, language. So the customs quickly became a very important source of money for the Qing government. So you can just see the figures the amounts increase very rapidly. So they're accounting for 20% of the national revenue. 
So this money pays back the indemnity from the Opium War, and there's still plenty more money left over. So this is spent on modernization projects, especially armaments, because China is very weak in this respect. And uh, Sir Robert is very active in advising the Chinese government what sort of armaments they need, negotiating with the, with the, buy with the sellers, and he gives uh, extremely detailed accounts of, of the kind of ships, the models, the engines, the size uh, of the kind of ship that he wants to buy. So here's one of the ships which was bought with the money from the customs, and this comes from Newcastle shipyard, and Sir Robert helped to negotiate the purchase of this ship. This is the Fuzhou shipyard, which was built with the money from the customs department, and this was under French military guidance. They hired French people to run it. <coughs> now, anybody tell me where this building is? Right. Now, why do I put this in at this moment? What is its relevance to our story? Yes. Now, this money was supposed to go for the Chinese Navy, but the Empress Dowager wanted a new garden for herself, so she took the money. So, as you see, it's very beautiful, but this was the result. So then China was having a war with France, and most of the war was fought on the sea. So the Chinese Navy did much better than in previous wars, but still it was losing because it didn't have the ships and the armaments it could have had if they had had the money. So the Chinese government is losing the war, and they want to stop the war, but they don't know how to do it, so they asked Sir Robert to do it. So this was a very um, important service he did. He was sitting in Beijing, and he had a telegraph machine, and he wrote coded messages to his secretary, called James Campbell, and Campbell is sitting in this hotel room in Paris, and he receives the coded messages about what China's negotiating position is, and what we'll give up, and what we won't give up. And these two men negotiate this peace agreement with France. Now, of course, the agreement is not so favorable to China in the end, but it's more favorable than it would have been if the war had gone on for six months or 12 months more, and maybe the French army would have invaded Beijing but the peace agreement prevents it. So you can see that um, the Chinese government was delighted about this, and the Empress Dowager gave him this very important honor. And it's the only time it was ever given to a foreigner, and it's an honor for three generations, not only for Sir Robert, but his children and his grandchildren. So who, who's that? The Kerry Lamb of China at that right. time. That's right. There it is. That's right. Okay. Okay. Now, w what's this photo? Where is Sir Robert in this photo? That's right. And why is he wearing a hat? It's not raining. There's no need to wear a hat. Why is he wearing a hat? Well, many people say it's because he was too small. You see, if he doesn't wear the hat, he's smaller than most of the members of this band. And some scholars say this is one reason he was so successful in China, because he was small. So Chinese did not find him intimidating and rude and arrogant like they found most of the foreigners. Anyway, this is the band that he set up and they used to play in his garden, either just for the pleasure of listening to music or for dancing after his parties. So there they are um, at work. So now we come to the Chinese post office, which was set up in, in 1896. And what happened in 1895? Very important event. In China? Thank you. So China was completely bankrupt after this war. There was no money. 
So they said to Sir Robert, you've got to set up the post office, but we've no money to give you. So he had to set it up entirely using the customs offices, the customs money, the customs system. So this is the first stamp issued by China, and that's one of the post offices that he set up. So I think we can call it the world's largest post office because China's population is 400 million at that time. So, so he's now running the customs service and he's running the post office. So 1899, he asks if he can have a holiday, but uh, he, he's too important. The, the government can't do without him, so they refuse to let him take a holiday. So what happens in 1900? Somebody said it already. Boxer Rebellion, yes. So, the Boxer Rebellion is happening. That means in Shandong, other provinces, they're killing foreigners, they're killing uh, Chinese Christians, they're burning down foreign buildings. But Sir Robert doesn't leave. I mean, he, he has all this information, but he doesn't leave. Why does he not leave? Well, he says, I work for Chinese government, right? I run the customs, I run the post office, I work for the Chinese government. So I'm not the target of the boxers. They won't attack me. So that's what he thought. But on the left is the photo of his house. So when, when the boxers came to Beijing and they came to the street where his house was, that's what they did. And they burned down his office also. They didn't make such a distinction. So here's a photo of one of the boxers. And there's more photos of the boxers. So the boxers then surround this small area in central Beijing, the legation area. So here's a very good photo of those people inside the legation area. Can you spot Sir Robert in this photo? So in this area, there's 1,300 foreigners, there's 31,000 Chinese. Most of them would be Christians. Foreigners are Yang Guizi, and the Christians are Er Yang Guizi. So if the boxers enter this area, they will kill the foreigners, but they will certainly kill Sir Robert because he was the most famous foreigner in China. So the siege lasts for 55 days but uh, the boxers do not succeed in, in, in getting in. And th this is a very good quote, because Sir Robert has a lot more information and insight than the other foreigners who were there. So his view was that actually the boxers could have taken it over, but they didn't. That's, that's what he thought. But the outside world doesn't know this, the, the communications are cut off. So the Times has an obituary of Sir Robert, and they're planning a big, a big uh, funeral for him. But luckily, he manages to get a message out to the secretary, and the secretary rings the prime minister, and they cancel the funeral at the last minute. So finally, the foreign troops arrive. They release, relieve the siege, and then the foreign troops behave in Beijing, similarly to the boxers, they pillage, they rape women, they kill many, many Chinese, many of them with no link to the boxers at all. And this is perhaps the most inspiring part of Sir Robert's story. So he's been, he's been trapped in this area 55 days. If the boxers had, had, had come in, they would have cut his head off. He has every reason to despise them. He has every reason to leave China and say, this is what you've done to me. But his reaction is the reverse. So he decides that he must get up and speak for China. Because at that moment in the world, the sentiment against China is very, very strong. Some people say we should get rid of this Qing dynasty. 
Others say we should break China up into different countries. Others say we should send somebody and from abroad to run it. But he takes the opposite view. So he writes this book, Thesis from the Land of Sinim. And Sinim come from Isaiah, and it just means a distant place. So in this book, he writes all these reasons why we should leave the dynasty in place, we should not partition China, and the Boxer Rebellion is primarily the, respo the responsibility of the foreigners. We drove Chinese to do this. That's the main argument. And it's a very brave man to argue it at this particular time. So he has these essays published in the UK, France, Germany, and USA with the idea to influence the policy makers. And it, it has, it succeeds. The foreigners don't really know what to do, so they are very much influenced by him because he's a very powerful and famous person. So they leave the dynasty in place and they don't break China up. So this is the last photo we have of Sir Robert in China. He's in Shanghai, he's just about to board the ship. And I think we can say he's not a very happy man to be leaving. I think he'd rather stay. But his wife didn't like China at all and lived most of her life with the children in a very big house in London, pressing him to go back. So because of his age, he decides to go back. So he is with his son and the grandson. And this is the last photo we have of him, 1911. The year of his death and also the year the, the, the dynasty ended. Now, anybody know where this statue was? It was on the Bund in Shanghai and he's facing the customs building on the Bund. And when the Japanese took the city over, they dismantled this statue and they melted it down. So it doesn't exist anymore. And this is what was written on the statue and Chinese is on the other side. So it's a very impressive uh, legacy. I'm sure Chip would say we don't speak ill of the dead, so would say it's not the whole story, but still, not bad. Oh, whoops. Sorry, I just threw grandfather in because he, he's similar to, to, to Sir Robert. His life is very similar. So his uh, grandfather's life is also available outside. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much, and welcome to your questions. <laughs> Thank you for your inspiring and very entertaining um, summary of your book and, uh, and a very fruitful uh, lecture. This seems to be a, a, an orient, an, a far eastern version of Lawrence Arabia, whose achievement, I would say, uh, was more exciting and, uh, and uh, more dramatic. That should have been uh, made into a, an Anglo-American collaborated Hollywood movie, and I'm sure. With the love affairs. With the love affairs, the of love course. Affairs. Yes. And then you could have Gong Li and Zhang Ji <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Fan Bingbing, right? And you could be Prince Gong in the <laughs> film, yes. <laughs> With my mustache, yes. Yes. And Fan Bingbing uh, and and a few more, right? Yes, yes. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the commercial all the time. Yeah. And, uh, right. and, uh, and Hart's final defense of the Boxers' Rebellion this is uh, made him a very patriotic and loved China, uh, a Guaylo, and that would please uh, the communist government in Beijing. So it's perfect, it's yes. perfect, right? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to one perhaps directed by Ridley Scott, Ridley Scott, <laughs> or Steven Spielberg, or Ang Lee in five right. years' time. Which role and would Mark you like? And be your, the script writer. And which role would you like, which oh, part would you like in there? I'd be like trumpeting for its uh, publicity when it is uh, 
uh, a screen in Hong Kong, and that's all. Right? <laughs> I'm glad that you, you uh, mentioned pr Princess Gong, formerly known as prin uh, pr not Princess, Prince Gong, mm. formerly known as Prince Kung. Right? Yeah. He was a pivotal figure that yeah. linked Shanghai and the Qing Dynasty with this man. He was without, a without, him, maker. without him, Sir Robert could not have held the job. I mean, so yes, I mean, he was uh, very much, a, he has been very much an underrated mm. historical and political figure in the mm. past uh, 150 years because I think the official Chinese government, the, of, uh, the official Chinese found him a little bit, a little bit difficult mm. to position and comment. Mm. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he has been seen as a, a half traitor mm. and half reformer. So now even the number two man, Wang Qishan in Beijing now, who has been launching a very powerful campaign of anti-corruption, and who has once been uh, in charge of foreign trade of China, has earned his nickname as Prince Kung by some of his political enemies, mm -hmm. calling him Gui Zi Liu, mm -hmm. the white devil number six, because he was the sixth son Mm. of the Dao Guang, or Emperor Dao Guang. Mm. And, uh, the th and, and, and the third son had been handpicked by Dao Guang as the emperor. Mm. So he was the brother of, uh, of, of, of the emperor after Dao Guang, Xianfeng. And when he, recru when he made that bold decision, that was a year after that famous or notorious coup, when uh, a few uh, advisors left behind and appointed by Xian Feng were arrested and executed. So that Prince Kung was well, emerged as a very powerful political figure. And at that time, Empress Dowager was too young, was only 28 or 29 something. And she was a novice uh, to uh, Chinese politics. And at that time, Prince Kung seized the at the, a good timing and a good opportunity to make a few key decisions. And that famously brought China into what they call a Zhong Xing, Tong Guang Zhong Xing, the, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what, what do you call it? Central. A revival, a revival, mm -hmm. a revival after a long time of uh, of weakness and uh, being invaded, uh, things like that. So a very key pivotal figure. And I wish Carrie Lam would employ or recruit someone like Hart as his chief secretary. And then the well, Hong we, Kong we, SAR we, government. We had a, a very nice uh, presentation <laughs> in, in Beijing. Yes. And uh, after the presentation, we have two questions. And the first one was from the Portuguese ambassador who said, you people, you Anglo-Saxons, you are all racist. <laughs> you have Asian ladies, and then you dump them. <laughs> but we, Portuguese, we take our Asian ladies with us down the aisle, and we marry them. He okay. said this jokingly. No, with are complete you sure? seriousness. Oh my God. And then he said, he said <laughs> the Qing government twice tried to buy Macau. So they said to Hart, go and buy Macau for us. Mm. But we can't do it officially. Mm. Do it, mm. you know, unofficially. So that's what Hart did. He, he sent an emissary to Lisbon. He found some people in the Portuguese government interested. There were negotiations, but he wasn't able to pull it off. So they weren't able to buy Macau back. Mm. Anyway, the ambassador was very angry about this mm. part of the story. Well, he reason. said, we love Macau so reason. much. It is our most important overseas yeah. possession. We would never sell it. <laughs> so then, <laughs> then we have a professor from the Beijing right. uh, model university. And he gets up and he said, just like Chip said, the problem of corruption in China is the same as in the, in the Hart's time. So what the government should do now is to hire people like Hart to yes. get rid of it. Mm. Now, I think we all know that yes. 跟人说人话, 跟鬼说鬼话, right, good. 
if he's speaking in a meeting of Chinese officials, he would not say such a thing. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> since most of the audience are foreigners, we are very happy to hear this. Mm. But anyway, he said it. Yes. So uh, I think at least the spirit of Hart yes. li lives on. If not, they won't hire him, but maybe they will learn from the systems he put in place. Yes. At least he was brave enough to raise a, a politically incorrect and anthropological question yes. right, in the midst of this, of this uh, time of, uh, of uh, political correctness. Anyway. And but he said that now uh, some scholars in China are indeed analyzing the customs uh, department's uh, systems mm -hmm. and, and, and structure. Because the for uh, foreigners and Chinese, we're all corrupt. We all want to steal money. The only way to stop you is if there is a, a system. Check and balance. Yeah, you are afraid mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. So he said that's what they are doing now. They are tr trying to find out is there something they can use from the custom system to, to implement today, yeah. But this Hang is certainly a very intriguing figure. He, he I wouldn't see him as a figure of uh, social justice, but a man of vices, right? And very ambitious. Very, very in ambitious. In the Cantonese sense, a gu wak zai. Ho gu wak. Ho gu wak. You know? Ai zai. <laughs> yes. Do, I mean, yeah. he came to China, well, I mean, partially wanted to help, partially wanted to earn good money, partially to treat China as a Bangkok or Pattaya or whatever, right? So, I mean, there was, that is what made him so intriguing and so rich. And he didn't come from the British ruling class. No. You know, he came from, from Ireland. Ireland. His father was in, uh, was in business. And in, you know, I, Britain is like a feudal system, a caste uh, system. Uh, he was not Brahmin. Yeah. So he thought if he goes to China, he can do things and he can, he can create things he couldn't create at home. An underdog from underdog. his home. Yes. And, yes. and he's small. He's small. Full of ironies. Mm. And he was from Methodist church. Yes. Methodist church, mm. right? Yes. And so did Margaret Thatcher. Yes. Margaret Thatcher's um, father was a yes. Methodist uh, priest in Lincolnshire. So people like him mm. would have very strong sense of principle mm. and uh, could be a bit of a zealot from mm. time to time when time came. But at the same time, at that, uh, a, a Victorian England would certainly not suit him. So I just wonder whether he left uh, some diaries or whatever. Oh, yes. Of true confessions. Yeah, I mean, the, the book is mostly from his writings. Mm -hmm. But except for the, the part about yeah. Miss Ayu. Yeah, he that didn't, unfortunately he didn't write was, anything. Was yeah. Well, he burned, was he burned it. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it, uh, he wrote very often to his family, to the secretary. Mm -hmm. And this is not for publication. <laughs> so, of course, it makes much better reading. Mm -hmm. It's not the official. Mm -hmm. Grandfather's writings were mostly for publication. Mm -hmm. So, bao si bu bao yao, right. you know, good news, all good news. Mm -hmm. But he included all the bad news as well as the good news. Right, okay. So, please, any questions? Please, yeah. Yes? Yes, that's that gentleman. Yeah. Custom service. I mean, he basically had the custom service write on whatever he felt he was interested in. So, for example, I know the Chinese in the coolies in uh, Cuba were being mistreated, and the custom service issued a report, I think, around 1880, investigating the mistreatment of the coolies in Cuba. And the custom service also produced reports on music and silk and etiquette. It's just an amazing legacy that he left behind in, the, in, in what the Customs Service decided to publish. Well, he encouraged his commissioners, who were in charge of the different ports, to write these reports. And there was a sort of competition among them. Um, <coughs> uh, and he was an uh, educator. You know, he wanted to modernize China. So he wanted to show that if you publish information, you spread knowledge, you educate people, 
So there were, these were the two motives. One was to encourage his commissioners to work outside their normal practice, and the other was to show to, to China that this is how we spread knowledge and information, um, uh, just, just as it done in, was done in Europe at that time. But I quite agree, it, it made a great contribution to China at that time. And he pr pu published an enormous amount of data too about the, the customs goods coming in and out, the revenue. He built a system of lighthouses, surveyed all the coast to make the shipping better. Um, all of this is to improve the, the life of China. Okay. Yao Xinlu, he is the former secretary of uh, transport under C. Y. Leung, so be very scared. Okay, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> oh, all right, good, okay. When, when Mark uh, was in Beijing, yeah, mm. yeah we, we are fellow generals. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a few questions, uh, two are uh, maybe factual ones, simple factual ones. Is the uh, Hart Avenue in Jim Sajis, in the streets named after Sir Robert? Of course, yeah, yes. Okay. yes. And second, is all the di uh, di um, uh, diaries and documents that you have access are now open or? Yeah, they're in the Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, I see. And, and the third one, I think uh, I would like to see how you elaborate the remarks that uh, Chip Charles uh, just picked up. It's about the mindset of uh, Prince Kong. You know, what sort of considerations that he have to, you know, have discussed to hire? Uh, uh, Sir Robert, so you, you have made a few points, I think, in your mm. presentation about the reliability of this man, but can you elaborate more? Because I think at that time, the, uh, I think the political uh, situation and also, I suspect there's a, a lot of tension there as well, you know, whether the Qing dynasty should hire a foreign, foreigner. Yeah, so, I think, so I think Prince Gong is in a very difficult place because China at that time is very weak. It's facing these very ambitious, greedy foreign powers which have armies which China cannot fight. Um, uh, China is having to pay these huge reparations from these wars which it's lost. Um, so Prince Kung realizes they need to generate revenue, they need to modernize. But he knows within the Qing government there are so many conservatives who are against this and against all foreigners, regard the foreigners as completely evil. So I think, he, what do we say, Chip? It's like playing poker with a very weak hand. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, China is not a sovereign state at that time. So I think he hired Hart because he thought he could generate money, he could run the customs service efficiently, which was a correct decision, and also because he trusted him. And I think this is the key point about these meetings. I think for most Chinese officials, foreigners were alien, untrustworthy, selfish, you know, just mm. trying to gain advantage for themselves and their countries, but they felt that Hart was actually someone with the interests of China at hand. And Prince Kong, I think, was the only far-sighted, open-minded, even a little bit liberal, but also an eccentric political figure at that time. And in the 19th century, I think, China, it took an eccentric, it would take an eccentric to uh, appreciate and understand an eccentric from the English-speaking world. I think there must have been some sort of chemistry built up. Otherwise, I was really surprised. And when Kung, Prince Kung said, China, if China had a hundred heart, right, China would be safe. Mm -hmm. I think that is still a very relevant quote nowadays. But yeah. I think Prince Kung was always vulnerable. Advanced. Always yes. vulnerable. Because people around him will say, this heart, mm. he's, he's, he's lying, yeah, he's, he's not representing China, he's serving the interests of the foreign powers. Uh, Unfortunately, he was why are you Why are you giving him so much power? I mean, yeah. he was always vulnerable to he, this. He was fortunately trusted by Emperor so, so Dowager. Prince Kong, I think, uh, he was a big gamble. A very big gamble. Well, you know the story of China's first railway, of course? Yes. 
It was built in Shanghai, and then Empress Dowager said it was disturbed the spirits below the ground. Yes. Uh, so we have to, it was removed and it was sent to Taiwan, and they built it in Taiwan instead. So that gives you the extent of this conservative mindset, that yes. modernization is not what the foreigners say it is. Modernization is a way for the foreigners to get control of our resources, you know, to, to, yes. to, to get a hold of our coal mines, our agricultural resources, our mineral resources, and the foreigners are dressing it up as modernization, but it's actually they're serving their own interests. So I Prince do. Kung all was always being attacked yeah. on this. But fortunately, he was trusted by Empress Dowager for a very, very long time. And I think that's strange, because the two went on different paths. Emp Empress Dowager was such a conservative. She would not have allowed Prince Kung to go that far. And the strange thing is, I think I always believed that there was some sort of suppressed, uh, suppressed uh, uh, love from Empress Dowager for Prince Kung because she lost her husband when she was very young, and Prince Kung was the younger brother of her form of her deceased husband, and that sort of deep, deep uh, suppressed intimacy or love was never allowed to service in a in the imperial court. Otherwise, it would you you would not have been able to explain all this because Empress Dowager was so angry with the six reformers, as late as in 1898, she would not allow any constitutional reform until her very last day when she was, uh, when she was in her early 70s or whatever. How would she have allowed Prince Kung to have such, so much power to appoint Hart and then launch a series of very bold reform policy at such an early age? I mean, this is worth exploring. But unfortunately, Chinese historians are not really interested in juicy areas like that. They are too serious. But you, it would be useful to read a Taiwanese, well, a mainland Chinese historian, Gao Gouya, Gao Yang, who has written meticulously on, on, the, um, on the history of, uh, of uh, 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 Empress Dowager, especially when she, she was young. And there were some, there are some hints by Gao Yang on this point. But very, very interesting indeed. Mark, thank you, first of all, for a great story. I have one question, which ports were not covered by the Imperial Maritime Customs? And the second question, how did the ports that were under his control communicate? How did the authorities in the various cities communicate? Well, his ports would be the ones that were uh, open for foreign trade. So the ones that were not open to foreign trade, they would not be under his control. How did they communicate? I think by telegraph. Am I right? That was the most advanced yes. form of communication. I think telegraph. So he demanded every month they have to send. Uh, they have to send a report of what they'd done in the months, and it was read by him personally every month. And this was one of his anti-corruption measures because they all knew that uh, um, uh, the reports would be read by him. Sorry, can I ask, say one more thing to uh, this question here? Uh, once I met Mr. Zhu uh, at the Beijing airport, and uh, we asked him some questions, and he's a very smart man. He gives very good answers. And then one of the American reporters said, oh, Mr. Zhu, you are very popular abroad. You know, everyone thinks you're very able and capable. And some people say, oh, the Chinese Gorbachev, you see. And when they said that, Mr. Zhu's expression completely changed. He became extremely angry. Yes. He said, you must never, ever use this expression. Never, ever write in any of your publications that I am the Chinese Gorbachev. And th th this time, we, we didn't understand. What is he speaking about? We thought Gorbachev was quite a 
a good person, no. reformist, you know, modernizing Soviet Union. But it is exactly the same as Prince Kong, mm. because Mr. Drew knew that if he was seen within the Communist Party as the favorite of the foreigners, then he's finished. Mm. So after that, Mr. Drew very rarely gave a press conference, mm. maybe NPC once a year, or maybe if he goes to America, he will give an interview to an American mm. TV station. But he would never give you know, interview to uh, a report he liked or, or just to explain China's policies. No, because if you do that, the others in the government will say, why are you doing this? What's your motive? So I think Prince Kung is the same. So I think Chinese government today is the mm. same. It is dangerous to yes. be close to, to foreigners. Another similar anecdote. When Premier Zhou Enlai visited Indonesia to attend the Bandung Conference, he was surrounded by a bunch of very friendly Western journalists, and one of, some of whom thought that Zhou Enlai was very charismatic, with a sense of humor, very liberal, and one said in salute, like, just being nice, long live Joe and I. And he went pale straight away. He turned around and pointed at that Western journalist. Don't say that again, for God's sake. And the journalist said, well, he had the same res uh, response. Why? What's wrong? I mean, in Western cultural context, calling saying something like long live Joe and I means a goodwill, means uh, uh, something, something nice, right? Rather than being obsequious. And then Joe and I went pale. Right? It's a point in the Chinese politics that uh, many, many Westerners would find very hard to grasp. If they understand, it would take him years after uh, having lived in China, perhaps. Can you say some more about his children, the ones they, he left behind in London? Any, any more about them? Yeah, well, I think we should say God is just, right? God is just. Why? God gave Sir Robert a wonderful life in China. He gave him 48 years in the, in the head of the customs department. He did so many things in China. I mean, it really, he, he, he lived a life which maybe 10 or 20 of us would have. Yes. But therefore, God cannot give him a happy family life because that would be too generous. Yeah. So, so in the Cantonese saying, in the Cantonese sense, the folk home do John uh, so, he, so I don't think he has, he has any options. You have no information about their so, so, so I'm now going to ask you. Yeah. So the, the six children then, it the, the was not a good story. So the three grew up in London with this foster family. And uh, they went to the ordinary school. They went to the secondary school. They graduate about 14. And then they work, worked in tra trades became apprentices, and they had quite an ordinary life. Um, Sir Robert never met them. He only communicated through his secretary. And two of them later emigrated to Canada. So there was one year when Lady Hart and her daughter were going back from China through Canada, and the two, two of the three were in Canada. So for about two months, Sir Robert was having heart attacks because he thought the two will find out <laughs> that Lady Hart and the daughter are staying in such and such hotel and they will go to the hotel right. and they're having breakfast oh and they walk over and they say, oh. you know. Yes. So, but his, his own children by Lady Hart, this, this was also a sad story because the, the, they... Um, his, his only son was uh, very lazy. He didn't study hard. Sir Robert wanted him to be a diplomat or a lawyer or a banker, but he, he didn't. Um, he drank a lot. He didn't work. And his, his own son was similar. 
So the line died. Mm. So that's why all the archives are with Queen's University, because <laughs> the, the line died out. Now his two daughters, they had uh, slightly happier lives, but nothing so much exceptional. So Hart was very disappointed in mm. his children, but yeah. I, I think given his life was so rich in himself in China, I think he shouldn't demand too much for the, for the children. But I like that heart attack ending, which reminds me of a similar heart attack ending of Dr. Shibaku. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, ver a version of a black comedy, perhaps, which, makes, w which would make a film version more interesting. But any, any um, question? Yes. Um, yes, uh, I want to know if uh, he has ever written anything about the trading houses in Canton. I mean, the powerful trader houses, and uh, anything about the trading houses in Shanghai as well? Well, the, the, the Sir Robert's main enemies actually were the foreign trading companies, because they preferred the old system. Because if you p paid uh, a red envelope to a customs official, you bring in your shipload of opium, you take out your shipload of uh, silk and tea, and you pay no duty on it. And the, the custom official will just say the, 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 the ship was carrying ballast or there was nothing in it. But after Sir Robert set up his system, of course, you had to pay the proper amount. So he was constantly at war with these trading companies. They would have preferred to have the, the old system. And they would constantly accuse him of you know, working for the Chinese, <laughs> which he was, because they thought he should be working for them. So this also led to some tensions with the embassies, because the embassies were representing the business interests of their countries. Um, so there were some negotiations. I think you can imagine them. Yes. On the one side is only the Guaylos. Yes. And on this side is also Which is amazing. Uh, Chinese people, but also some Guaylos with Sir Robert in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, representing China. So uh, I think from these stories, I think Sir Robert uh, emerges with great credit yes. that he was representing China. He was not representing the interests of the foreign powers. Yeah. yeah just, just to talk. Um, Actually, I think um, we were, uh, you say Prince Kong uh, trusted him before he set up the um, customs, correct? Well, as I s mentioned, uh, Sir Robert went to Beijing. He met Prince Kong several times during a period of three weeks. And it was after that Prince Kong was convinced by him <coughs> that he, he appointed him as the commissioner and told him to set it up. That but but I, I mean, we must add what we've just said, that for Prince Kong, this is a huge bet he's taking. He doesn't really know this man. He doesn't really know what the custom service is going to be like. But he's giving this man this power and this money. So uh, Prince Kong is a brave, is a brave man. Yeah. Sorry. I would have imagined that during the three weeks' time, probably Sir Robert would have convinced him of the economic interest that could get that the Qing Dynasty can get from the customs. Imagine that is uh, at that time, I'm, Miss Prince Kong must know how much revenue they have lost during the uh, in the trading process without the customs. And somehow, I somehow uh, Sir Robert might have convinced him of this, and this is why one of the reasons why they got in trust with him. Yeah, I think this is the key point. Uh, before the meetings, Sir Robert did a lot of research, and he said in the beginning, Prince Kung was not very clear what, what it is the customs do. So he first of all had to explain how the custom service works, and then he explained how, when we do it, this is what we will levy on the ships coming in, this is what we levy on the ships going out, how do we monitor? And Kung was convinced by all this detail. And finally, he understood mm -hmm. how the system worked. And I think the economic argument is the critical one and the reason why he was kept for 48 years. I think there were many 
opinions about Hart. Many people were against him. Why do we have a foreigner in this position? But at the end of the day, he was able to deliver this money every year to the exchequer. So Prince Kong and the other reformists were able to say, well, look, look at this. If we do not have this money, how do we buy battleships or how do we pay our army or how do we pay our civil servants? So that was the, the key reason he held the job for so long. Yeah. I'm not sure whether that was, it was that simple. To strike a business deal in China, you n usually need to go to a nightclub with a few Chinese <laughs> officials. They might have visited the same brothel in China, in Beijing, you never know. Right. <laughs> okay? Yes, that gentleman. Mark, um, what's the Communist Party view of art? And has it become more nuanced over time? Well, we went to the Customs Museum in Beijing to answer this question. And uh, the answer was not very positive. The view in this museum was that he was an uh, imperialist. He was serving the interests of the foreign powers. And he was put there by the foreign powers to, to earn all this money, which would then go to the foreigners, either in the form of reparations or to buy foreign products or to pay for foreign loans and bonds. This was the view in the, in the Chinese Communist Museum. But, but you're right, in the last five years, the view has become more nuanced, and I would say more accurate. But I still think if you met a mainland scholar and asked him directly, he would have to tell you that he was an imperialist, but wearing the clothes of a Qing official speaking nicely Chinese, but still imperialists at heart. Is that the latest official uh, interpretation? No, now it's a bit better, right. but if you were a Chinese professor yes, right. and you were in Hong Kong and someone yeah. asked you, you won't be wrong if you give right. that answer. Okay, yeah, that's you right. know, No one will criticize you. A universal you one. Yes. Exceeding Jian Ren, Shuo Ren, Hua Jian Gui, Shuo Right. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you are speaking to an model audience, audience only of foreigners, you could give a slightly nicer words. Model answer. Yeah. yeah. This should be recommended to the Education Bureau if they need to run the national But I, I must add that in Republic of China, the story is oh, completely different. different. Mm. They <laughs> issue a stamp for him in 1985, 150th anniversary of his death, of his birth. And after the Qing uh, dynasty fell, the Republic of China kept the customs service exactly the same form, run by foreigners until 1950. And even after 1950, the Republic of China shrank, so they didn't need such a big service, so they, they, they paid off the foreign staff. But they invited the chief to come to Taipei twice, three times a year for meetings. And he's in the textbooks, and so when I was giving my presentation in Taipei, it was quite embarrassing because the journalists were mm -hmm. far too well informed. Mm. Yes. They asked questions which mm. I cannot answer, but you, you can't say that. Mm. One of them said, what? what did he wear when he visited the uh, Empress Dowager? He was challenging you. Yeah. Did he wear uh, the mm. Western suit or did <coughs> he wear the Chinese mm. suit? Because this man had read in a novel that mm. he... he, he he wore the Chinese mm. oh, really? long oh. gown to the Empress Dowager. Mm. But you, you can't say you don't know. Uh -huh. So I said, uh, no, 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 he still wear the suits because yes. he was a bit conservative in that yes. sense. I don't really know. Yes. So we, we must distinguish between what the PRC view and the ROC view. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, he was a very smart guy. He, he, in the beginning, he didn't know anything, but he would then go to best practice. So he would look at uh, Germany, uh, UK, France, I mean, the, the most advanced countries at that time, and he would see what was their practice. And uh, he, 
he had many friends all over Europe and North America. He corresponded with them all the time. So he was able to obtain this information. Uh, and so he would introduce this kind of practice um, in, in China. And of course, at that time, in China, the Chinese wouldn't have access to this information. They wouldn't know how to get it. So he had something very valuable to them. Yeah. Yes, his imperial honor. What would that translate to in the UK honor system? Something like, uh, I would say something like uh, between the CBE and the KBE, something like that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Knight and commander. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think he valued more the honors from Chinese side, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we m must say, one in one year, the ambassador of Britain in Beijing died and he went to the funeral, and he, he was just regarding the coffin, and one of the British officials said to him, would you like to take the job? And he thought about it for a long time, but refused. He preferred to stay in, in, in the customs. So I think Chip, this is quite a glorious story. Mm, yes. He was being offered the top post so unique. for the world's biggest empire at that right. time yeah. in China, and he declined it. Sorry, gentlemen, we're running out of time, so we'll take one more question from the lady, that side. Mark, um, another question. Do you have, have you had any difficulties when you were doing your researches, any confusions or any factual confusions? Do you have any examples of that? Well, um, the confusion is you must try to be as balanced as possible. And I'm from Ireland. I like... Sir Robert Hart, I like my grandfather, I think they're heroic people. But of course that's not the proper view of a historian. Mm. So you must read as much as possible the view of Chinese historians, including of course the mainland historians, mm. Mm. and you must... Be impartial. Impartial, be and factual. you must be very factual, and you, Clear must, minded. you must read carefully what they yes. say, you must mm. not say you know, because they're from mainland, they're, they have an agenda. You must properly consider all the things they are saying. Yeah. And so you must try to have a version that is as balanced as possible. And this is why we are very grateful to, to, to San Lian for giving Chinese version. Very because unusual. Because if you have Chinese version, you must be a impartial. No, no, not Chinese. It's a communist book publisher. You no, 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 but you must be <laughs> impartial because <laughs> Chinese are going to read your book. So yeah. if you have only present a, you know, very much partial pro-Western view, that, that is not accurate. It will not be acceptable to a Chinese because reader. Because the San Lian is an officially Chinese publisher. So you, must, you should take advantage of this. Ask them to bring this book into the mainland yes. and simplify characters. But it is a great, it's a great uh, honor to have to have the books available in both mm. languages, really, it's it's, mm. and I think it's a good way to force you to be and to be to be properly balanced. And also, an English version, the English version of this book should be more widely read, at least in Ireland and in England, to promote a better understanding of modern China, which is badly needed now. I think, badly needed, a, a, a missing lesson. So in March, we went to, to, to Beijing to do promotions of yes. this book. And we signed agreement with the, the, the uh, joint publishing, the, the Beijing branch, for the, for the book of last year mm. to be published. So mm. a week ago, I sent email to the, the man in Beijing. I said, how is it going? And he said, we're still in the shen cha zhong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> shen cha what? Shen cha what? So for, <laughs> for the book on the Palace Museums to be published, it has to be mm. approved by the Yuan mm. Bumen. So nobody knows how long this will take, one year or yeah, two years. Yeah, forget about China. Just get the English version. Yeah. Promote it as much as you can. Because as far as I know, the British Education Department has been reforming the history curriculum in the secondary school. Mm. And they have added China, Mao, and cultural revolution and great famine, etc. Mm. 
to the secondary school mm. history curriculum mm. because of the of such need mm. in the coming few decades. And I think this is a very important missing link to help the next generation of English uh, speaking uh, people to understand the psyche, uh, the mindset of China, and understand better uh, such things like cultural clashes that will facilitate their dealings with China in the future. So I would say Sir Robert is a very modern figure. Yes. Because all of the big noses in this room, including me, we are mm. all like Sir Robert. Relevant. We all arrive here, we know nothing, we have no idea how no. to deal with people, how to deal with Chinese bureaucracy, mm. Chinese rules. What do we do? So here is your rule book. Yeah. Follow what he book did. Book of references. And you will do very well. Maybe not two wives, mm. maybe only one wife. But it would say, yeah. Yeah. well, I mean, the wives aside, side, That's right? right. Okay. Wives That's aside, right. <laughs> it would be great advantage, of course. And that's why another David Lean version of uh, Lawrence of Arabia is needed as well, mm. right? Mm. If one was made in the 1960s. Yeah. So thank you, uh, thank Mr. Neil, and th thank you, Mr. Chow, for this wonderful discussions and lecture. And uh, thank you also for the questions from the floor. So um, copies of the book are available for purchase outside the seminar room. And our speaker is also welcome for book lovers to maybe sign some autographs.